Right, so people have different guesses of how you can um, optimize your tau, right? Um, so one way we try to do it is by looking at um, different rates, right, and comparing them. So somebody was uh, mentioning that, and so there's this the standard kind of method, there's many other ones. Um, we'll talk about the rock curve and the, the PR curve um, is kind of the basic ones. Receiver operating characteristic curve, we just say rock. Um, or ROC, some people do. So they actually used it initially um, in World War II. They invented it for this to help like figure out how to tune their radar systems to stop incoming planes, I guess, in Britain. Um, and it really helped because there's different, I guess, gains on how much of the signal. It's like, is this an incoming plane or is it just a bird, right? So there's a real threshold that you want to say, if the signal's strong enough, then it's a plane. And if you get it wrong, a lot of people die because the bomber gets through. Um, so they wanted to figure that out. And they had this one knob on their radar, I guess, um, which was our tau, which is a threshold of how big or how strong does the signal have to be for us to categorize it as uh, an enemy um, incoming on the radar, right? Um, so the idea is basically you try different values of this, right? So we'll set it to 0 0.1, we'll set it to 0 0.2, assuming um, it's just as a percentage, but um, it could be defined different ways. Set it to 0.3 and all the way up, up to one. Um, I guess you could even have zero. And we try these different values out, right? And so if you think about um, uh, our classifier, and um, now instead of, if we go back to our, um, our KNN that we have, right? Um, when I uh, apply KNN to it, I now say, uh, what's the probability of it being in class one? I've got two thirds, one third. Um, I don't know how many classes we have. Let's say we can have you know, more, more possibilities. Um, Right, so we've got a bunch of different um, values here that are continuous, and then based on tau, we would get a certain set of them. Right, so if tau is um, no, that's not very useful. If tau is uh, two thirds, then it would be very um, aggressive and only capture the ones that are correct. Right, so the lower tau is, the more points are going to be in there, and so this rock curve basically carves out a shape through the space um, where you. Uh, see how it performs, right? And I have, there's a cool website uh, linked there, which um, has a nice little demo, which is easier than me doing it. So that's that link here. And they have actually code here for how to, how to calculate that. So you can kind of just implement it um, in, their, in their library, I guess, which is calculations in Python or whatever. They also have a little discussion about what, why we use all these different words and it's precision or recall or sensitivity or what, but really it's, you know, is it the signal? Is it the background? Which I was labeling as, um, is it uh, the true the true value or a model giving the uh, response? Is it the class? I guess when they're saying is signal is background, it's is it in the class? Is it not in the class? And did you get it correct or not? I don't know if this is simpler. He thinks it's simpler. But what he has, um, whether you like his description or not, he's got a very nice um, demo thing here. And so you'd imagine um, you've got your classifier, right? And it says, imagine now you said your threshold um, really, uh, low, then um, you'd basically put all the all the elements in the class. And if you set it really high, then you get none of them in the class, right? And so um, at the extremes, you know you're, um, it's easy to get them all right. You just have to say everything's in the class, that's easy. Uh, right, but that's cheating. And so um, what I'm trying to get is to tell you the plots. Um, right, so what we're plotting, and I think I can use this annotation thing here, right? What we're plotting is um, the really troop. <laughs> okay, see, this is why I don't like WebEx. The true positive rate versus the um, false positive rate. Oh, that's why it says it here. For some reason, the moment I do anything, it um, disappears. All right, you get the idea. Um, 
so that um, those true positive rates and false positive rates that we have uh, are here. And you imagine then um, what do we have? Our threshold of this point, um, and I guess we've set the threshold here to be one regardless. I forget how this thing works. Yeah, so the threshold here is set to be one. So tau equals one. And you can tell for that point, here's where you are on the curve. So if we have two distributions you're trying to um, distinguish, right? So in this case, now we've got um, two very well-defined um, well defined classes that are easy to separate and our threshold's a little high, um, but it means definitely everything we get's correct and we never get anything wrong because the threshold's so far into the other class, right? This is the frequency of how often these points, the different two classes A and B occur. And here's your threshold for your score, right? And in that case, the rock curve just becomes this um, invisible uh, line, right? That you can't see um, because it's perfect. Um, obviously you're getting it perfect because your threshold's so high that um, you only restrict yourself to things that um, they're above the score. But then um, if you make it so that they're separated, you get the same thing. But once they're kind of overlapping, and I'm going the wrong way, so that's actually harder, um, you start seeing that you've got this curve. And the curve is constructed by saying, um, like the point here is if, if tau equals one in this case, you run your classifier, you count all the well, you run the classifier once, really, um, to get your scores. You get um, the scores of for every point, like we have, those continuous um, numbers, like a probability. And then you use your threshold to cut it off and make the, the classification. Um, you divide them into two sets, right? And you count them with the confusion matrix. But you do this for every value. So you set tau to different values, and you count, compute your confusion matrix, and then compute this. That's what gives you this curve. So that's the essence of the idea of it. Um, Let's go back to the slide so we can see this thing. Um, but then the, um, right, so you can see what that happens there, that um, if you run your threshold over this, this range, you'll get different trade-offs, right? And so this curve just tells you kind of something about how good this algorithm is in general, how sensitive it is to that threshold that you're setting. Um, and if the data is certain things, that's easier. Um, you might be in different places. Generally, you want to be here, right? You want to be in the top left corner um, of this curve. Hopefully, people can see my my mouse, um, because that would mean you're not getting any of the ones wrong, and you're all getting all of the ones right, right? So, if your true positive rate is um, one, then everything that's correct, you caught it, and your false. Sorry, if your true positive rate. Yeah, is one. If your false positive rate is zero, then that means, right, you look over here, the ones that you got wrong are zero, um, and you basically didn't get anything wrong. But that's usually not going to happen. So what you want to do is pick your tau. The rule of thumb is that you kind of plot a rock curve, and then you pick a tau that's somehow closest to this point in the top left corner, right? So this is the optimal one, or the best you're going to get, given this data and your model. Sometimes you might get lucky, and your thing can be a little closer. Um, but then you got to either improve your model or change the data somehow come up with a different algorithm. So that's one way you can pick tau. Does that make sense? Yeah, the reference for this website is on the uh, slide, and the slide should be available on Learn. Um, you can also click and move around. In I think in this tool, you can actually go back a slide yourself. It's I was told you're supposed to, according to the app. Um, did just somebody ask about the distributions, right? The, the, the Gaussians here um, are like the distribution of the data, right? So um, all the data points in this class, um, I guess what we're talking about here is what your function returns for points in that class. So if your class um, is really good, can I do this? Well, I can do it here. It's easier for me to draw on this one. Um, ah. If your um, if your data points are all no, I should use A and B. Um, let's say these are all A, and um, it's more about uh, given some different data points. Um, what would your function return? So these are the values that your um, your f of x return, right? 
So um, if you what, what you really want for a good classifier, you want these to be easily distinguishable, right? So there's a clear cutoff so that values that are in class A have lower values and values that are in class B. Basically, you want to construct your algorithm such that that's true, and then it'll be easy to make it use it for classification. It's all about building a function that maps from your input data to some kind of number that's easily distinguishable, right? Um, so these aren't distributions of the data themselves, they're a distribution of your function on the data, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so the black dot on the green line here on the rock curve is tau equals one um, from their demonstration on the website, um, his tool. He's showing it what it looks like when it's one. Um, but all the other values are when tau are different values. So all these ones when tau is slightly increased and when slightly decreased. Right. Um, yeah, and then another thing we can also use is then talk about the area under this curve. Because if you compute the area under this, right, it'll give you one single number, and that number tells you kind of how well um, you're doing in general, right? So it also the area under the curve. Oh, why would they do move as a default action? Um, is literally the area under this if you just compute it, and if you know the function of this, but you can kind of compute it geometric like a computationally. Um, and ideally you want this to equal, um, <laughs> of course, it's gone. Um, an area under the curve of uh, one is the best because that would mean you got them all right and none of them wrong, right? And that's kind of also means you did something wrong in your analysis because you probably can't get it perfect. So never trust um, your algorithm saying that you got it perfect. It could be that the data is too easy. Um, but it's more likely that you miss something. Um, lost the audio. I sorry about that. I accidentally clicked the audio button when I was trying to uh, turn off annotating. It seems like. Could people hear me now? Great. You were explaining area under rock. Okay, so maybe you didn't hear the whole area under the rock curve. Um, Right, so it's literally, yeah. So the uh, the area under this curve is is that's what's described here. Here's a nice kind of layout of it. Um, and like I said, if that area um, equals um, one, then that means you've got perfect performance, right? You've got all the ones correct and none of the incorrect ones. Um, but usually that would mean there's something wrong with your analysis or your or the your algorithm, you miss something when you're adding, or it could mean the data is too easy. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen. But um, you want to have your A or C be as high as possible, but um, it can't go higher than one because that would be basically being perfect, right? So, um, and uh, the other thing you can think about with that, right, is that, um, how do we do this? Let's say they're, the classes are indistinguishable, right? They're just completely the same. Your function has no, dis this is really bad too. This says that your, um, um, your algorithm right now, they produce the exact same numbers for all the values in both classes and you can't use anything to distinguish them using a simple threshold and your raw curve would look like this, right? Um, so that's as bad as it can get um, because basically it means you uh, it's like 50-50 whether it works. If your raw curve looks like this, what would it mean? Anybody know what that means? Because sometimes you'll see that and it's actually a bug in the way you've called it. It's not good. You get more wrong than right. You should reverse it, right? There's someone says it, right? Because this is basically a model that says like, you're really good at getting it wrong, right? You say that you can almost get, you know, um, you know, 80% of the time, if you just did the opposite of what you did, you'd be better off, um, which is literally true, right? Because if you just, took that algorithm that produced this curve and added negative to them or just flipped the two classes, then you'd have the reverse, right? Um, so it either means you're inputting the data wrong to your rock calculation or uh, there's something weird in your algorithm or your algorithm is, you know, returning the wrong label on purpose. Um, so yeah, the, the worst you should be able to get is a straight line and that just means it's completely useless at distinguishing anything um, in it. Um, somebody was asking about precision and recall. We'll talk about this a bit and then I'll go back and see if anyone has a comment on the previous stuff. Um, this is from the Wikipedia page on precision recall. Like I said, a lot of 
Wikipedia's got pretty good um, articles that people have honed over time to explain it. It's just a nice figure um, if it's uh, getting, if you get confused about true positives, false positives, false negatives. Um, and uh, right, the idea is that these are the relevant ones. So in my description, these are um, in, in the class um, that you're trying to uh, determine, right? So if we're saying that they're in class A, so these are in class A. Um, and these are, uh, um, you could say, not in class A um, or, in, or in the other class. Um, and then um, in their circle are the ones where they're saying, what did your algorithm say? Um, your algorithm, your classifier said, these points are in the class, they're in the circle, and the, the four types are whether um, you're in there or not. And we talk about precision and recall is another thing, rather than doing um, true positive rate and false positive rate, another thing people often use will be precision and recall, um, where you say, get all the ones that you got right, um, that were actually right, and you said they were in the class, and divide that by everything you said, whether it was right or wrong, right? So that's kind of like, how much can we trust you? Right, 80% of what you say is true. Okay, that's that's where you get this, right? Um, because how many, it doesn't matter how many there are, maybe you only got 10% of the true ones, but if you said it's in the class, there's like an 80% chance it's in the class, so I can trust what you say, but I don't know if you're missing any, right? This doesn't say anything about whether you're missing half the correct answers or not, but it means I can how much I can trust whether you're correct about this, right? Because if your false positives are bigger than your true positives, this will be a really small fraction, right? Um, whereas recall gets the other one, right? So of, of the ones you said were true, um, how many, um, how big is the ones you said are true versus the ones you missed, right? So you said these people um, um, have uh, COVID and um, how many people did you miss that don't have COVID, right? And so the test they give now, they say they're, they're 95%, um, I don't know if they say accuracy, um, but they often want to talk about this for, for diagnosis things, right? Because, you know, like, um, if someone has it, you want to capture most of them, right? You don't want to miss that many, um, right? And so if there's, you know, 900 here and 950 here, then you're doing pretty good, right? You're not missing so many. Um, but they're different concepts and they're just using those counts that we're talking about, right? Because um, we have those here, so we have a little bit more precision to recall. Um, the fraction of detections that are actually positive, the fraction of positives that we actually detected, right? So um, you can just think those over um, in your head and see if they make sense. Um, what was n plus hat? What's our other notation? All right, so if we go back to um, our first slide, um, this is uh, the number of ones in this, it's the sum of the, the rows from the original confusion matrix, right? Um, it's in an earlier slide, but is your um, true positives plus your false positives, right? So all the ones you said are in the class, um, whether they're true or false, given by that, right? Um, does that make sense? Reverse prediction, okay. So now we can plot those as well, right? So we can plot on the precision versus the recall and still vary tau in the same way. And you could do this with any of the different metrics. These are the two most common ones. Um, and you get what we call a um, precision recall curve, right? And this is also useful. Um, so if we have on the same data set and the same um, algorithm and the same thresholds, we do the same thing. We vary the thresholds from zero over one, and then we compute uh, how many are in the class and then uh, give us ourselves uh, these two curves. So in, the, in these diagrams, um, A and B are two different taus, right? So um, whatever, this is using tau uh, one, sorry, not T. Um, this is using tau one and this is using tau two, these two different numbers. And obviously A is better than B. Um, and in this case, A is better than B as well, right? So um, you want to be um, here in, in both of them. Because that's what kind of the perfect performance would be. And so you'd want to pick a tau that's somewhere here, right? Um, but you can pick that. So you can use multiple of these plots and then try to find the optimal tau that's kind of balances off these different things. 
Um, so the precision recall is useful in different areas. You can always apply both. Um, it's useful when there's a very small number of uh, positive cases, right? So uh, in COVID, they probably use that a lot. They use it in medical diagnosis, right? Because you don't actually have that many people sick and you have tens of thousands or millions of people that you test. Um, and so you actually want to make sure that you're maximizing um, not missing anyone, right? So you're looking at this re relationship between um, how much I can trust you versus um, how many you're missing and what's that ratio, right? And you want it to be uh, balanced between the two things because they're both important to you. Um, yeah, and so it looks the other way and it's just, that's another uh, curve. So using those two together is a, is a BR baseline way to pick a threshold for, for classification algorithms that have thresholds. So Rowan has a question, I thought different tiles were just different locations on the same rock curve. Yes. A is better than B. True, right? Yeah, you caught a flaw in my thing. I just jumped straight to it and didn't, didn't um, go back and think about it. Um, right, because the tau tells us that's what draws the curve. Um, so what are A and B? A and B are different algorithms. I'm sorry. Yes, great catch. Um, this is why I want more live sections because in the front of the whiteboard, we would just come up with this and find it. Um, but in a, an online lecture, we might just miss it. Good. So that was wrong. Do people know why I'm wrong? Why it's wrong? What slide am I on? I think it's slide 10. No, it's slide 12. I'm just going to delete all these annotations. It is not straightforward to delete annotations. Oh, come on. Okay. Does anybody know why? Maybe Rowan can explain. What, what should it actually be? What are the two, um, what do the two lines represent? Could they represent? Different algorithms. Yeah, so maybe I said different classes. Um, right, so uh, if you have two different um, either algorithms or some other parameter, right, so maybe maybe this is um, K and N, um, sorry, with uh, K equal to two, and this is with K equal to three, right? That's one possibility. Or maybe, um, this is decision trees and this is neural networks or um, this is KNN and something else. So something's different about them. They're coming up with a different classification, um, but the tau is ranged across both because they both have a threshold of some kind to determine their classification. And then um, you get these curves, you're trying to pick which one you should use, right? So for K, um, for KNN, using different numbers of neighbors would be a good one to say, so like what's the right number of neighbors to use and what's the right tau? And then you'd plot a couple of different rock curves um, and um, come up with the right answer. Great. So there's a bunch of other um, measures we can compute. So um, accuracy was kind of people um, kind of use kind of most uh, colloquially in kind of the news or anywhere. Um, it's just computed by space on that, right? So that's how many uh, you, uh, get right versus how many there are, right? So obviously um, this just equals um, the full size of the data set, which I want to write as n, but since n is negatives, um, right, all the data. Um, right, so how often are you, what portion of the time are you correct, right, out of all the data, or how many of, how many of the, yeah, how, what, what portion of the correct cases did you get correct? Um, and error is how often are you wrong, right? So those are kind of related. Precision we have, um, recall sensitivity we have here. Um, F measure is a slightly more complicated one that kind of combines a bunch of these, the precision and the recall, but um, weights it by um, weights it by those measures themselves, uh, and they all have different kind of senses, uh, reasons to be used. So um, it's actually the um, harmonic mean 
of the precision and the recall um, and sort of uh, helps you combine together a bunch of these. So it's, it's used a lot in right in document retrieval and, um, and things like that. So because you're, you want to make sure you're um, getting all the all the cases correctly, but you're also not missing a, a significant proportion. Um, but it gives you this score, so it's called F1 score or F measure. Um, it's a common one to want to optimize. Um, K. So K would not be tau. Um, right, because K because um, remember, so it's somebody asking if k, um, if k and n, if k is the tau, uh, you could uh, remember in a k and n for a given k, say that you have three neighbors and you compute these these scores, these probabilities of every class being m, given the number of neighbors, you could just say, well, whichever one has the most, um, the highest score is the one in the class, right? But you could also look at the distribution and only um, Say it's in in this given class if um, if it's got a high enough uh, a high enough probability, then you'd have to have something set up to say what if it's not in there, so you wouldn't give a, an answer. So um, you could use k as the tau itself, um, or you could say we're going to set a set a k and then have a threshold for us to be in that class. And if we can't be sure it's in the class, we'll say it's not in the class. Um, but any any variable um, from the, any parameter of the algorithm that you can use to produce lots of different um, variations in the, the classification results would be one that you could use as tau. Threshold is kind of the the most meaningful because you're taking that number and using it to decide. So the other um, concept I just want to add is a couple more slides on this. Let me wrap up. Um, is about um, another thing to look at for performance, and it kind of relates. This isn't as um, concrete thing, but it's another way to plot a graph and figure out um, how to pick the right parameters, right, in a similar way that we do with the rock curve. Um, so what we don't want to do um, is overfit to our data, right? Um, so overfitting is going to be um, a big problem, but it's also underfitting um, basically um, the two sides of the same coin. Um, and in general, we talk about this whole area saying what's the capacity of the model, right? Um, so um, we want our model to be generalizable. So we trained it on a bunch of data, and then um, it performs well on, on other data afterwards. Um, but then um, we want it to be set up so that it works well even on data we haven't seen or didn't test it on. Right. So with KNN, we're not kind of learning a model directly. Picking the K is the only thing we have to do, um, unless we have a threshold like tau. Um, but you still could say, well, how well does it do on data that we didn't use to make that decision, the test data? Um, and so if you tune it too much to the data you've seen and not to the data you, that it didn't see, uh, you, you're going to do worse. Um, so maybe this will make more sense. Maybe. Um, Maybe it'll make more sense when we have other models that we're looking at, but we'll just go through this and then we can come back to it later if it's um, not helpful. Because um, the main idea is like, say you've got um, some prediction, some model that's saying, well, here's the, here's the actual data, right? So we've got these points X and maybe as a human, we're gonna look at it and say, it should go like this, right? I know this kind of a curve, I can see it. You're imagining all these points because you don't actually see them, but you think they're there. Um, and so um, we think that's the best, uh, fit uh, model, but I mean, maybe more data will, will change the reality of it. But when we're talking about underfitting, um, we say we're, we're basically coming with something that is too simple, um, basically uh, captures a bit of the trend, but doesn't capture as much of the complexity as it could. So there's going to be a lot of errors here, which could be kind of improved upon. But with a straight line, you can't do any better than this because it's a very simple model, right? So simple linear models are often going to underfit because you don't have enough strength to do it. Um, on the flip side, if you have a very complex model, um, like neural network or decision tree, you can overfit, you can get some very specific model that goes to every single point um, and um, 
never gets it wrong, but then it's got a very unnatural feel. It's like, well, why would you think it's going to go down here, right? Maybe this is a um, like a third order polynomial, right? It says, well, it can go up and down, so we can do these kind of things, but it can't really um, do anything better. And so it came up with this model, which is really bad, right? It's correct on the data you gave it, but it's going to be give you very bad predictions here because it thinks they're going to be down here for some reason because that's the function, right? So ideally, you want something smooth. Um, and where the errors are kind of small and at least they're reasonable. But it depends on the data you have. Like you don't know if these are really the next data points. So it's kind of, um, it's not an exact science saying what the, the true answer is because you don't know. Only if you have all the data can you say for sure. But what you can do, um, given the data you have, is to say, um, what's the capacity of the model and have I um, overtrained it or not? Um, and so, um, You've got um, this idea of the capacity, which we'll kind of represent as having how, what your error is, right? So you could look at error, or you could plot accuracy, you could plot any of these, um, you could plot F score, any of these things that we've talked about, um, and then look at um, as you give it more data and you train it, what happens, right? And so some models then um, the error goes down, which is good, right? Um, so we want that, um, right? But uh, as we go on, it's not necessarily getting um, very much better, and you don't really realize what's happening. You just keep going, and at some point, it starts getting worse again um, because um, you're <laughs> overfitting it, right? And the idea, what we're testing here, is you're testing on um, the generalization gap is tested on the um, on the test set, right? Uh, so you have your train, validate, and test set, and um, you want to compute your error on the test set, but on the training set, um, it's obviously going to keep getting better. So as you give it more data, it should get better and better, hopefully, most models will. Um, but they might get worse and worse on the test set because now they've overfit and they're doing that kind of thing where they're you know, specifically fitting every point even though you don't know what's going on in the middle um, of this space, right? Um, and so it can actually get worse if you train it more um, in some models. Um, and so the, the idea is you'd want to pick um, the amount of um, the amount of training or any other parameters um, of your model uh, to go in here, right? So you want to pick when you should stop. Um, it could be based on other parameters, but it's kind of um, when should you stop training it? It would be at this level where it stops getting better, right? Um, and this is related to other ways of trying to like quantify capacity. It's it's hard to do, but if you have a, a mathematical description of your algorithm, there's these things called um, the VC dimension, um, which really measures the capacity of it. Um, and like I said, if it's available and you know the formulation of it, then you can tell what's the uh, power of this algorithm that you have. Um, but it's not always possible to define what that is. Um, And um, it's really more defined for, for models that uh, have a certain fixed number of parameters and um, don't, uh, they have a simple formulation, but they have a, a limit on how, how powerful they can be. So um, like I said, uh, this actually is maybe coming a bit early compared to other things. So when we get to models where we can use this, um, I'll come back to it. It could be in a different slide deck, but. Um, that's where I am for this stuff today. Um, so I'll go look at the um, chat here and see if there's any other. Is generalization pattern recognition? I mean, yeah, pattern recognition is a very general term, so it could be any finding any patterns in your in your data. But generalization is the goal of pattern recognition, machine learning. You want a model that is generalizable. You trained it on some data, but then when you find these data points, it's going to be perfectly fit and it's going to give you the right answer, right? Um, but doing that is tricky because you don't know what these data points are beforehand, right? Um, Yes, yeah, Sophia's got the question about the rock curve. Yes, that's. I think that sounds right. Um, yeah, you try different tiles or different parameters of your algorithm and thresholds, and compute those counts, and then you plot it, um, and you try to pick the the right threshold that you're going to use. I 
I mean, in a way, it's not technically the optimal um, tau. So what's the way to, right way to pick the right tau here? So these plots are from the Kevin Murphy book. Um, so if you look at that textbook, you probably have lots more um, background and theory on it. Um, they just kind of sometimes just plot a straight line through. So you can say, what's the, the closest point here? Um, to the closest point to this corner is, is going to be somehow the best trade-off of tau, but it's not really optimal, right? Because um, if it's more important for you to get um, this rate, um, sorry, this rate higher rather than, than that one, um, then you might prefer this, right? So if false positives are much worse to you than true positives, you might prefer this, this number, even though it's got a longer distance. Um, but the, the best trade-off between them is the one that's closest to this corner. And the same here, it's the one that's closest to this corner, whatever that is. Um, but it isn't optimal in the classic sense that it's it's the best perfect one um, because it's still, um, you're getting things wrong, right? You just want to have a trade-off between the two. So all these different methods can be, um, numbers can be used. Um, they're all just scores, so you can plot them, accuracy, precision. It depends what's important to you, right? So different domains um, prefer to see one or the other. Um, and there's many more than this, obviously, but these are kind of some of the central ones. And what you're trying to do is um, make your algorithm better, perform better, and um, get less, do less mistakes, right? So these are just ways to help you figure out how you're doing. Um, and like I said, it depends which one's more important for which you choose to use. Um, for us, uh, we'll, we'll tell you which one we want to use for a particular question, um, or we'll, uh, we would go into why some might be more useful than others. Because um, the result of why the ones are better than another is dependent on, on what it's maximizing, right? So like I said, precision is useful when you care about um, how trustworthy the algorithm is, right? Is it what percentage of his things are correct, right? If you're willing to go and find more correct elements, right? So you want to say you got an object detector um, for your car and it detects pedestrians, you want precision to be very high. It says when it tells you there's a pedestrian, um, it's usually right, right? But if it misses a lot of pedestrians, you still want to have another system that helps you find even more of them, right? Um, so what's a better example? I guess for pedestrian detection, you want recall to be very high, that it doesn't miss anyone, right? That's important. Um, but for for a, say for an autonomous car system, what would be the thing you care about precision more? Um, other cars on the road. If I mean in terms of like um, collision avoidance, right? So where you're just about to hit a car in front of you, so at that threshold about whether that's true or not, you definitely don't want to get that wrong much um, because then the car will break randomly. But then again, you don't want to miss it. So <laughs> so um, recall is always important if you don't want to miss one of the elements. I mean, in some cases, recall might not be important. Maybe it's some um, financial thing or something like, uh, what's the best stock to vest in today? If you miss this one, um, it's not going to be into the world because you can go again and find something else. But if you're giving wrong predictions, if you have low precision, um, but high recall on a financial prediction thing, which stock to buy today, you wouldn't make very much money, right? Because um, you'd be wrong a lot if you had low precision and you'd be, recall would be high. So you'd be missing, you wouldn't miss many, but, um, the ones you give would have a high ratio of being wrong. So um, I don't know. You can think through different examples of that. Maybe we can have a discussion about that. I don't know if precision recalls for skewed data. It's yes, yeah, it is skewed because so, it's about um, what did we say? Um, if there's a small number of positive cases, so if it's a data set is skewed, right, where um, you have a very large population of um, true and false. Right, so this could be um, has the disease and doesn't, um, but most people don't. Um, precision recall helps you tease that out better, right? Because if you just go by accuracy ratios, um, you might miss it, right? So, um, yeah, because if you talk about how many of your ones were correct, it'd still be a ratio of three to how many else there were, right? Whereas precision is, um, it has, um, it's not scaled by the entire data set, it's scaled by only the, the true data set, that's why. It's normalized by um, by the, the true cases. All right, good. And there are other curves, so we can um, talk about that kind of elsewhere and look at other ones. I'm just 
giving you the ones that can never use the most commonly. Um, and then uh, if people want to have more discussion of that on uh, online, we can create a thread for it and find the right resources for people because they do get updated all the time for these ones with classics. Um, okay, so I'm going to end it there. And uh, thank everyone for coming. And uh, we'll make sure this thing gets saved and put online. And uh, let me know um, whether it was useful. Um, maybe I'll do a poll actually on Piazza about the different methods we've used so far, because I know some people couldn't hear us. We'll have to find out how many people missed it. Great. Okay, so there's one more question about sklearn. Um, yeah, rock, sklearn has a, has a rock curve um, kind of a function for it. So I forget if it lets you what it lets you set. It automatically goes over the tiles. You just have to give it. You give it essentially your um, all of the the values. If, you, if your classifier returns a function value that tells you like higher means it's in the class. This f x f of x. Um, the rock curve. Uh, package automatically basically goes through the points and keeps adding them in order of how likely they are given your function. And that's essentially the same as moving the, the tau um, through the different values, right? So um, it does it automatically. But it doesn't have to be a probability. Um, so the question is, is tau chosen for algorithms that output a probability? Um, it's not. It could be um, any algorithm that Returns a function, so the, the the output value, the f of x, doesn't have to be a probability. It could just be any number. So it could be just an increasing number, as long as it means that the higher the number, the more likely it is in a certain class. Um, you could use it. Right? It doesn't have to be a, a, literally a probability, but as long as you have a continuous score for being in the class.